welcome back. You saw the title, we're gonna go right into it. Inheritable Weapons Tier List. Ready, set, go. So I got five tiers. I got S, A, B, C, and LOL. LOL is pretty self-explanatory and it keeps going up and up and up, you know, whatever has the most quality, the most variety, the most bang for their buck, essentially. And for me, the cream of the crop is absolutely going to be the swords, axes, and bows, followed by the lances, blue tomes, and daggers, then the red tomes and staves, then the green tomes and dragon breaths. And then at the bottom, just the only inheritable colorless tome for some reason, you have that. It's easy enough to list these, but I want to at least explain my reasoning behind each and every one of these placements and go over some notable inheritable options. So we may as well just get started with the swords. The swords have actually really struggled in terms of just inheritable weapons for really, really long. But ever since Winter Manuela came out with Winter Rapier, it's just been snowballing because pretty much every single month, maybe minus a couple of exceptions, we've probably been getting a brand new inheritable sword or some seasonal sword that was previously locked behind the seasonal, now in the normal pool. And the ones that are brand new and or seasonal locked still, they do offer quite a bit. But let's go over some of the notable ones. We have Allied Sword, which is just a basic, simple support weapon, which, you know what, it's nice to have around regardless, especially considering the last inheritable sword that was supportive was Kadumatsu, and that was pretty much the first New Year's banner with Camilla on it. So to have something that's just readily available for support is really nice in general. I'll be, it's not necessarily like the most amazing sword, but if you're using a support unit that is a sword, this isn't a bad option. And just recently on the second summer banner, we had Coral Saber, which is just basically the second half of Divine Tier thing, AKA gives a guaranteed follow-up with an attack defense boost. And this is probably one of the best inheritable swords that we have right now, mainly because it just grants a guaranteed follow-up, which is really, really solid. Not only for the slower units who can't really function in the enemy phase without quick repost, but the faster ones who now don't even need no follow-up as they can just make a speed check to bypass any impact effects. So this is really, really nice to have. You also have the recently added Florid King from the last Tempest Trial, which is just near trace, which is still really good on its own, especially since now you could put this on maybe like a cavalry unit so they can run flows and gain even more effects. Or you could put this on like an infantry unit with Tempest and just have some sort of canto on like any sort of unit. Or you could go the meme route and give it to Arden with Assault Troop. And even though it won't necessarily like work amazingly, it could still be fun. And then for your typical just player phase brave, you have Ninja Katana. We have better variants for the axes and lances, but for what it's worth, it's still a decent inheritable, especially for the especially for newer units that have really high attack and pretty workable speed, or even good speed at that. It's just a nice weapon to have in general, especially if you were to put this on maybe Brave Alm, even though he has his refined Draco Falchion, this is still a nice weapon for player phasing in general. Then you have Rain Sword, which is just your typical debuff sword for speed defense. It's good just offensively. It's not like the craziest, but it's still a nice inheritable nevertheless, because it's still pretty much just plus five attack and speed during combat. So for what it's worth, it's not a bad inheritable, but we definitely have better options. We also have Spirited Sword, which was previously Pledged Blade on Bridal Obero, but now we have it on Skaha. And this is basically the Missile Tain effect that grants attack and defense plus four during combat, which can be really good for just getting specials in and out rapidly, which is nice, all things considered. Especially if you have this paired with Special Spiral and Ignis, you could have an Ignis go off every time you retaliate on the first hit during combat. And then you also have Upfront Blade, which is also a recent addition. It's basically Springy Lance, but sword. It basically neutralizes any penalties to your attack and speed, as well as grants an attack speed bonus, which is still pretty good for what it's worth, especially if you're looking to secure doubles in general. And then we also have the Vulture Blade, which is also another recent addition we got from the Blazing Blade banner, which was maybe a few months ago, but it's still fairly recent, all things considered. It's basically plug-in torch, but sword. And it debuffs a bunch of attack and defense, so that's really, really nice for just stat stacking in general. And then, of course, as previously mentioned, we have Winter Rapier. If you were to slap this on just a melee specialist or an armor, they will actually be able to stack up so much attack and defense with this, provided that they are debuffed. This could end up being a really, really potent weapon against the right team. And because of all the notable options that they have, not just notable options, but really competitive notable options, I find that they do maintain their spot in S tier, which is why I put them up there. Axes also follow a similar route where they have pretty much the same weapons, but they also have some other ones that swords don't. Love Candelabra exists, pretty much the same allied sword copy paste, yada yada yada. You have Ninja Masakari, which is the equivalent of Ninja Katana, which again, speedy, brave weapon. 
Always nice to have. You also have Rain Axe, which debuffs. Same thing as Galzus. But you also have Seahorse Axe, which even though it's just Coral Saber, again, it's Axe Form. And this is still one of the best axes that we have in the game, again, because it's a guaranteed follow-up, which is really, really nice to have in general. Not only just for your slower units, but your faster units, too, as you can pretty much perform really adequately in both phases. You also have Shuriken Cleaver, which is basically an upgraded variant of Ninja Masakari, as it grants true damage if you are faster than your foe by a certain amount of points, which is really nice to have. You have Spirited Axe, which is again the equivalent of Spirited Sword. Missile Taint Effect was originally a huge fan on Groom Hinata, now it's in the pool. Came out, I think, last year on the first Book 6 banner, which, you know what, really nice. You have Springy Axe, which is again pretty much just upfront blade, but Axe form. This came out first, so Upfront Blade is definitely the newer rendition, but still, penalty neutralization to your attack and speed as well as an attack speed bonus. Really nice to have if you're looking to just to secure doubles in general. And then, in terms of new weaponry, we have Stout Axe, which is a fantastic weapon for just defensive plays in general, because if you are a unit that's meant to like tank in the enemy phase, having the ability to reduce more damage taken, especially if you are more prone to getting doubles, is really, really good to have around. So, definitely one of the more notable candidates for this is definitely going to be Brave Edelgard because she gets 50% reduced on the first hit because of Stout Axe and then because of Black Eagle Rule she gets another 80% taken off on the second hit meaning that she's always getting damage reduction on each of the foes hit unless A they have Brave or B they have some conditional or whatever the case may be that basically pierces through any sort of damage reduction. You also have Victor Fish which is a really nice melee specialist weapon as it not only debuffs for defense and boosts your own but you also get the Binding Necklace effect which basically steals any sort of visible buff from the foe that they will have to their defense meaning that you'll probably hit and tank a bit harder as a result and then finally we have vulture axe which is just pluggy and axe pretty self-explanatory again really really nice weapon all things considered and then we get to the final weapon type in s tier and that's bows bows also have quite a lot similarly to axes and swords they have their own bit of inheritance that most other weapon types really can't replicate but for the most part they also share a similar amount of effects such as Courtly Bow, which is just the same thing as the Stout Axe, same thing, damage reduction on first hit if the foe can double, really nice to have on your defensive armors. Monstrous Bow, which is gimmicky, but if you are able to just land a single hit regardless of the amount of damage you put out, then you're inflicting Panic Smoke. It's not really like the most coveted bow, for, but for what it's worth, it can have its niches. So I still would put it up here. You also have plug in Bow, which again, simple, self-explanatory. You basically inflict a bunch of debuffs on the foe during combat. Really, really nice to have. You have Rain Bow, which is still akin to Rain Sword and Rain Axe. Debuffs during combat, self-explanatory. But then you get to Spendthrift Bow, which is minus seven attack on the foe and plus seven attack to yourself during combat, which makes all the defensive bows extremely tanky. This is basically just a plus seven attack defense res bow which is really really nice to have especially for your armors who could just double with fighter skills making them not only even more bulky but harder to take down and able to just output more damage in general which is really really nice the only caveat is that if you don't trigger your special it's going to get reduced back by two points but if you could trigger your special consistently it's not really going to be that big of an issue you also have springy bow which is akin to upfront blade and all the similar effects where Again, attack speed, penalty neutralization, and an attack speed bonus. Really nice stuff. You have Tanabo, which is the equivalent of Winter Rapier, but for bows. You get the Unity effect, which is really, really nice. And it is free, but I'm not taking accessibility into consideration. It's still nice regardless, but again, Unity Bow, really good. However, in my opinion, what really put bows up here is White Cap Bow. When you tell me that we get a conditional Speedy Brave Bow that has no might penalty and can be refined for even more speed or attack or whatever you want i say this absolutely puts bows in s tier because it does help out so many speedy bows that otherwise would be struggling in today's meta and while it's not necessarily like the most crazy crazy inheritable and it doesn't put like some bows into like super high rankings it does help out so much to where it just raises the floor for quality in general and it feels like that a lot of bows just aren't left out anymore in terms of just player phase or enemy phase prowess depending on what they specialize in as now each bow can pretty much do what they need to do and that's why i also have bows up here and that's as far as the s rank goes then we have the lances which they also share a similar amount of effects to 
all the other ones, so we'll pretty much skim through a lot of them. Allied Lance, same thing as Allied Sword and Love Can't Labra. Attack, Defense, Drive during combat. Also works on yourself, so it's a joint drive. Really nice stuff. Bridal Sunflower, which is definitely a bit more unique. You also have it on Red Tone, and we'll get to that in a bit. But it's basically a bonus doubler effect to their respective stats during combat, which can be nice for general tanking and damage output. But then we have its Curtains, which currently isn't really replicable. We do have the Dagger variant, but... You can't really Gale Force with it because ranged units can't use Gale Force unless you're a Legendary Leaf or a Siren Leaf. But nevertheless, it's pretty much just Quick Impulse 2, which is a really, really good effect, especially if you're looking to just have Gale Force ready to go. This can be really good for just Gale Force compositions in general. And if you want to put it on a specific unit, you can put it on OG Azura so you can have a Gale Force Stancher, which is really, really nice. Then you have Ninja Naginado, which is the equivalent of the Shuriken Cleaver, which is still plus four true damage if you meet the specific speed check, which pretty easy to do if you put on the right unit. You have Ninja Yari, which is basically the older variant of Ninja Naginata. Plus four speed, minus four defense res during combat. Player phase, brave weapon, you get the gist. But then we also have Piercing Tribute, which to my knowledge isn't replicated by another inheritable. It's currently only on lances. And it basically just shuts down any sort of guaranteed follow-ups, which is really, really good. You have Spirited Spear, which is equivalent to the Spirited Sword and Spirited Axe. Does the same thing, Missile Tain Effect, yada yada yada. You also have Springy Lance, which pretty much the same thing as a Front Blade, Springy Bow, Springy Axe, Attack Speed Penalty Neutralization, and Attack Speed Bonus. Really good stuff. And then you also have Stout Lance, which is also on Axes, but it's still a really good effect nonetheless because it just makes your defensive armors and just any sort of enemy phase unit really, really coveted in terms of just tanking in general, which is why... They're also up here in terms of A. I don't think the lances have as much going for them as the swords and axes do, but they still have quite a lot nonetheless, which is why I put them up in A. Honestly, if we had a seahorse axe equivalent for lances, I feel like I could justify putting them in S, but for what it's worth, I still think they have some of the strongest inheritables in the game, just not as much as swords, axes, and bows. And then we get the blue tomes, which is a bit more limited, but they do have a fair amount of options when it comes to both their player phase and defensive plays. So Drifting Grace, which is an attack speed boost as well as a Renewal Tome, it does kind of damper on Desperation setups, but nevertheless it's still an attack speed boost tome, and that's not necessarily the worst, especially if you're just looking to enter like one combat per phase, which isn't necessarily that bad. You also have Floor Guide, which is pretty much the equivalent, you just lose out on the Renewal effect and that's pretty much it. But then you also have Pack Blooms, which is really really good for defensive plays because not only does it debuff the foe for attack and res, but it heals you per hit for 4 HP. Meaning that your sustainability is really, really high if you have the defensive stats for it. And then you also have Silver Goblet, which is basically just Distant Guard, and that's not necessarily the worst, especially if you were to pair it with other supportive skills. You can put this on, like, any support blue unit. You can keep it on Renea, and it's not that bad in terms of support. I'd definitely say that I'd put it up there with the likes of Allied Sword and Allied Lance. Even though, like, you aren't getting the attack, you're still getting res for it, which still pretty decent. And then you also have Spider Plush, which is a really, really, really good defensive weapon, because not only does it debuff the foe for attack and boost your own attack, but it also inflicts guard on the foe, meaning that unless they have a tempo effect or any sort of accelerated cooldown, then they're not going to get a special on you, which is really, really good defensively. Pack Bloom does debuff and heal, but you are more prone to damage if they can get a special off, which is why I do find that Spider Plush is definitely one of the better options in terms of defensive plays, which is why I have Blue Tums above their contemporaries up here in the A tier. And then finally in the A tier, we have Daggers with pretty much a good amount of options, both player phase and enemy phase. Albeit, it definitely leans more in the player phase, and in terms of the player phase options, I find that if it weren't for like one specific inheritable, then they probably would be a tier below, but I think the inheritable definitely keeps them up here. But let's go in order real quick. We have Bone Carver, which is basically the equivalent of Jafar's PRF. It, it's a savage blow dagger, and it grants attack speed. Pretty simple. It's nice for chip support. Pretty much that. You have Broadleaf Fan, which was a really old coveted meta dagger where you basically stack up attack based on how many debuffs the foe has. And while it definitely has lost a bit of value nowadays because of pretty much just penalty neutralization skills and unities, I find that this is still a decent weapon if the foe doesn't have these effects. And they may not per se, but given how common stuff like Brave Hector and Ascendi Yudun are, it's definitely going to be a lot harder to pull off, especially nowadays. But nevertheless, it's still a decent weapon. You have Courtly Mask, which isn't nearly as common, mainly because we don't really have that many 
defensive daggers outside of Winter Cecilia, and for what it's worth, she could still make really good use of it, and it's not a bad effect whatsoever, which is why I do have it up here, in terms of just notable highlights. We also have the recently added Florid Knife, which isn't exactly as good as Kanto remaining plus one, but because it's fixed Kanto, you don't necessarily have to worry about overextending, and you can still run out with one space no matter what. So it definitely has a lot more going for it than something like Kanto remaining and that's it. It's still a decent inheritable. You also have Goody Boot, which is basically defense res form, pretty self-explanatory, really only good for the defensive daggers, and as far as I remember, it's pretty much just Winter Cecilia, so may as well just call it a PRF, call it a day. But you can still use it on any other dagger, I just find that it's definitely going to be better if you can work in the enemy phase, because this is how these weapons tend to shine more. You also have Quick Dagger, which is basically the It's Curtains equivalent, so this could be good for just charging up AoEs or instant lethalities or whatever the case may be. It's a nice dagger, all things considered. I would still say Curtains is a bit better just because you could Gale Force with it, but nevertheless, there are plenty of things you can do with Quick Dagger. You also have Tamari, which is a coveted support dagger, as it's basically just sabotage attack and speed. Really, really nice stuff, especially if you were to put it on Tethys, base air, any high-res dagger, you name it. And then, the dagger I was pretty much hinting at from the very beginning, Vicious Dagger, or Courtly Fan, is a half null follow-up weapon that pretty much allows any sort of player phase dagger to function, even the ranged flyers, as they can run Wind Sweep and Water Sweep. And to me, this is what makes daggers really, really good. They have all the other inheritables, sure, but Vicious Dagger is still one of those really, really good inheritables, which is why I do think, in terms of just inheritable options, they still hold up quite well. And that's it in terms of the A tier. Then we get to the B tier, where it's pretty much run-of-the-mill average, in my opinion. Nothing, like, too good, but nothing, like, too bad either. And in terms of Red Tones, they don't have a lot of options, but for what they have, it's not necessarily the worst. We have Bridal Orchid on Bride Cecilia, which is basically Bridal Sunflower but for attack and res, bonus doubler, so on and so forth. Not really too bad. You have Luminous Grace, which is basically Drifting Grace but red. You also have the Vulture Tome, which is just Plugian. It's pretty good stuff if you're looking just to debuff your foe to Oblivion and pretty much just inflating your overall bulk and offensive prowess. It's not the worst by any means. And then the last option is pretty much just Unity Blooms, which is just Pack Blooms, debuffs and healing per hit. Not bad whatsoever. They don't have a lot of options, but the options that they do have definitely more B tier in my opinion. Because it's pretty, like again, run of the mill. Nothing too amazing, but nothing too bad to warrant anything lower. And I can pretty much say the same thing for staves. For the most part, they've pretty much just kept the same stuff. Minus the ones with PRFs. But in terms of inheritables, it's pretty much the same run of the mill stuff that we've had for years. Flash, prevent counterattacks. Grand Scratcher, Quick Impulse to the highest attack unit at the start of turn 1. Melancholy, which is Guard and Guard Smoke. Observant Staff, which is a Spectrum 6 and Dull Staff. So this can be good for just stat balling any sort of staff unit. Maybe for an armor, but maybe that's about it. You don't generally use staves in the enemy phase, but you still can with this one. And it does have a 3 space limit, so it's not necessarily the worst. You have Pain, which is one of the classics. It basically just inflicts 10 damage on foes within 2 spaces after combat. Pretty good. You have Palm Staff, which can be used for save balling, as it's basically an attack speed rain effect for minus 5. You also have Panic, which self-explanatory, Panic Status, Panic Ploy, Sudden Panic, yada yada yada. You have Serpentine Staff, which is basically an upgraded variant of Pain, but rather than 10 damage, it's 7 damage, and it has Fatal Smoke built into it, which can be really nice. And then finally we have Staff of Tribute, which is just a defense res bonus during combat, and it heals the user and allies within 2 spaces after combat. So this can also be really good for defensive units. And that's as far as the staves go. And then we get to the final tier, which is basically green tomes and dragons. We don't have a lot of options for them, and the options that we do have are really, really limited in scope, which is why I put them at the second lowest tier, above colorless tomes for obvious reasons, so we may as well just talk about them real quick. As far as green tomes go, we have Amity Blooms, which is just pack blooms and unity blooms, same effect, minus attack res on the foe and heal per hit. Not bad whatsoever. We have Grand Vulture, which is plug-in for green tomes. We have Snow Globe, which is the attack res unity tome, which is really, really nice for general tanking because you can stack it up with other unities and become a pretty big stat ball if you end up being debuffed. And then we have Spectral Tome, which is the equivalent of Monstrous Bow as it's basically just built in Panic Smoke 
and it's so gimmicky, but if you were to pair this with other smokes, then it could actually be pretty decent in the right hands. And with all that said, they do have a good amount of options. However, as you notice, most of these options are really enemy phase oriented. There aren't any notable player phase green tomes outside of maybe Fox, but that's not really a good weapon. If you really had to use it, it works, but comparatively to red tomes and blue tomes, I find that they just lack a lot more which is why I do have them in the C tier. And then dragons really don't have anything. They have Glittering Breath, which is nice for defensive plays, as it's, again, defense res form, akin to Goody Boot. And then you also have Lantern Breath, which is basically the equivalent of Spider Plush, which is really, really nice. But outside of that, most of the options that are readily available aren't really as good or strictly worse than most dragons' PRFs. And most dragons nowadays have PRFs, there are some that don't, but in my opinion, you're pretty much just best using either of these, as the other ones don't provide as many decent effects in my opinion, or again, are strictly worse. Which is why I have the Dragon Stones or Dragon Breaths or whatever in the C tier. And these are pretty much my general opinions for the Inheritables, but you'll have to let me know what you think down below. Am I being a bit harsh on maybe the Green Tomes and the Dragons? Do you want to see some higher, some lower? Let me know what you think down below, and until next time... I'll see you later.